Five women savagely mutilated were the victims of the most notorious serial killer ever to elude police. He was known as Jack the Ripper. He was a cunning and egotistical killer with a penchant for extracting organs from his victims. He terrorized the streets of London in the fall of 1888. Who was Jack the Ripper? Why hasn't he been identified? Biography takes a look at those questions as we profile the most notorious and intriguing figure in criminal history, the Phantom of Death, Jack the Ripper. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get the chance. Good luck, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. It's a year after Sherlock Holmes first appeared in print. You've got the Victorian gaslit streets of London. You've also got the appeal of the name, Jack the Ripper. The murders became famous. Once the name Jack the Ripper had been invented, they became a total sensation. It was not enough only that the woman should be killed, but also should be mutilated. Uh, be sure about that every part of the body should be, uh, should be hacked together. They were the first sexual serial murders to occur in a major town, a leading capital city, and they were the first to achieve international publicity. In the history of American crime, oh, he, what fascinates people is not the murders themselves, it's the puzzle. Who? Who did it? Why weren't they caught? And it's that puzzle which teases everybody. London, England, the West End, city of commerce, culture, and high fashion. A society of wealthy gentlemen in top hats and cutaways. Their wives, gentle ladies. Their children, tended by nannies. Queen Victoria reigns supreme. In contrast, the East End, where 900,000 impoverished people lived in cramped, filthy slums, and entire families were homeless. Whitechapel, the most destitute area of all, is where the murders took place. This outcast community was ignored and reviled by Victorian London. The East End, having become a dirty, run-down industrial district, now, in a time of economic depression at the end of the 1880s, was an area of overcrowding, misery and unemployment, and an area where at any time almost any woman might have to prostitute herself as the only way to feed her children. I've talked to person after person from the East End today who said, yes, they always reckoned Grandma had to go out on the streets when time was bad, and nobody thought any of the worse of her for it. The life of these women, one tends to sometimes forget, is just how brutal and how harsh it was. You could buy one of these women for three pennies, or two pennies, or a loaf of stale bread. The price of three pennies was fixed because that was what the women would pay for a large glass of gin. Dear father, I just wrote to say you will be glad to know I am settled in my new place and going all right up to now. They are very nice people and I have not much to do. I hope you are all right and the boy has work. So goodbye now for the present. Yours truly, Polly. Answer soon, please. And uh, 
Let me narrow you. Polly Nichols was murdered on the 31st of August, 1888. And on that particular day, she'd had three customers. But she'd spent the money on gin. So when she turned up at the lodging house to get a bed for the night, not only was she drunk, but she didn't have any money for a bed. But she felt pretty confident about getting a fourth customer because she thought she looked particularly attractive. And the reason she thought she looked so attractive was because she was wearing a new hat. I mean, she was drunk, she'd got five front teeth missing, but she was wearing this new hat. And the last words of the lodging house keeper were, see what a jolly bonnet I'm wearing. August the 31st, 1888, was the first Ripper murder. Mary Ann Nichols, known as Polly, a street walker in her early 40s, was found dead in Bucks Row, Whitechapel, at approximately a quarter to four in the morning. She had been dead approximately 20 minutes when she was found, and in the mortuary, they discovered that not only had her throat been cut, but there was a great gash in her abdomen. Now these murders became very famous for a most peculiar reason. The very first elections to the London County Council were taking place and the radicals, the extreme leftists, thought they had a very good chance of winning the East End. The radical newspapers, particularly the Star and the Pall Mall Gazette, two London evening newspapers, realised that if they wrote up the murders, they could draw attention to the terrible social conditions of the East End, and they did. And they sold more papers than anybody had thought possible. As far as the public attention was concerned, you could say that journalists were absolutely responsible for part of the fear and the fervour. When you look at the papers of the time, you see the lurid front page illustrations on police news and equally lurid uh, treatment of the subject on the inside. Even the Times fell for it. Even the Times was swept away by ripper fervour and ripper fever. A nameless reprobate. Half beast, half man is at large. Deadly, cunning. Insatiable thirst for blood. If you could take my unit and I back to 1888, to the crime scene, uh, I would suggest that we focus in on the first homicide. Generally, the first homicide is the focal point, is the area where the subject feels the most comfortable. And that would be the area where either he is employed or where he resides. I believe the subject would go back to the scene, go back there and kind of hang around there and fantasize and relive the crime. You can have situations where the murderer's standing here, the victim's lying there, the murderer's covered in the victim's blood, he's left his fingerprints and handprints all over the murder scene. There's no way you could combine the two. The scientific knowledge didn't exist for that to happen. So literally, you have got to uh, catch the murderer in the act of murder. On the 8th of September, 1888, at 10 to 6 in the morning, the second victim was found. She had been kicked out of her nearby lodging house at midnight for not having the money she needed to pay for her bed. She expected to earn it, but clearly didn't find it as she was last seen alive at a quarter past five, negotiating with a client who was probably Jack the Ripper on the pavement outside number 29 Hanbury Street. Her throat had been cut she had been savagely mutilated, disemboweled, and her uterus taken away. If ever the Ripper was going to be caught, it was, it was then. Because they're out in the backyard, and a man in the next door house comes down to the yard, obviously, to relieve himself, because this is what the yards were used for. And he's standing there, and he hears something fall against the fence, and a woman's voice say, no. Now, the fence is only five foot high. All he's got to do is look over the fence and he would have seen Chapman with her killer, with a ripper. In these extraordinarily difficult cases where a roaming sexual killer attacks people he doesn't know, so you can't follow up people's associates, if he attacks prostitutes, he's attacking women who automatically go off to dark corners with half a dozen strange men every day. How on earth are you going to find which one is doing the killing? I think by Victorian standards, the investigation into the series of Whitechapel murders was conducted as well as possibly they could manage in those days. They put extra manpower on the streets. They had intensive door-to-door uh, -door inquiries. All leads were followed up, even ridiculous leads. Prostitutes described a local man who had been threatening them. 
Well, he's short and he's stocky and he's got the blackest hair and a 